All right, so uh, in th this is the last section then. All right, um, it, it says uh, final greetings if you have a heading in your Bible. Um, other other uh, Bibles will say fellow workers. I, I came up with biblical friendship, <laughs> which I've already said. But this is the closing remarks to the church at Colossae from Paul in his letter here. Paul is done with instruction, and now he's going to add some personal comments, okay? So here, we're going to get a list of people who had helped Paul in his ministry, all right? A lot of times in cl closing sections of a letter, uh, this is the, the common part, the common theme. But they can also be overlooked, um, there's many times when I just see that we get to the closing part and I'm just like, all right, done with that, that book. <laughs> Go to the next one sometimes. Um, because of that, though, there's some insight that can be lost. Uh, there's some people that you may not know their names that well, but you can look them up. I'll tell you guys where to find these people. We're not going to look at all those texts, but I'm just going to give you some insight, some background for these people. So what this closing revealed to the Colossians and what it reveals to us is that Paul wasn't working alone. That, that's the main thing. He's not working alone. Many worked with Paul, and Paul knows that without these people, that his ministry would not have been as effective. And so he acknowledges that, and he includes these people in this closing to this letter. All right, so verse 7 and we're just going to take it verse by verse instead of reading it a whole right at the beginning. Verse 7, all right, we have Tychicus. <laughs> Tychicus, all right. It says, he, Tychicus, will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. All right, so Tychicus, <laughs> he's not as well known as others in Scripture, but he is the primary messenger uh, he traveled with Paul. He joined him from Ephesus to Jerusalem at the end of Paul's third missionary trip. All right, so he was with Paul his first time in Roman prison. He carries this letter uh, from there to the church at Colossae. We also know he was from the Roman province of Asia. And all of this, if you're taking notes, is found in Acts 20. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 16 and 1 Corinthians 18, you will find his name. So he's sort of one of those no-name servants of God in the New Testament, all right? Um, but being that, it didn't matter the impact because he made a big impact for the cause of Christ. He was Paul's servant uh, to the churches of Lycus, um, of the Lycus Valley, he delivered the epistles of Colossians and Ephesians to their destinations. He was also sent to take Timothy's place, freeing Timothy to rejoin Paul, who wanted to see him before he met his death. So Paul gives three expressions, okay? And these expressions that he wrote, they, they express his admiration of Tychicus. He says he's a beloved brother, a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. All right. Now, the Greek says the beloved brother. So he was well loved, having uh, endured himself uh, to, to Paul by his love for Christ. He was dependable in every way, it seems, uh, because he's called a faithful minister or a servant. And that means in the Greek, an attendant or a waiter. So it seems that Tychicus had this great concern for Paul and the body of Christ than in serving his own interest, all right? He's truly a servant, okay? And so that last expression then uh, is a fellow servant in the Lord, all right? So in the Greek, Paul saying he is a co-slave. So what this reveals here is the kinship that Paul had with him as a servant and a brother in Christ. Uh, he, he's not only was a brother, he's beloved, not only a minister, but a faithful one, and not only a servant, but a fellow servant, all right? So he sees them as all these things. Verse 9, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts, and with him, 
Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. All right, so Paul sent him with this letter for two purposes. To provide information about himself <laughs> and the current state of his ministry to encourage the Colossians. You okay? <laughs> right? So, all we learn about Onesimus is that he's a faithful and beloved brother. And that he was originally from Colossae because he states, who is one of you? All right, so he's originally from there. So if one were to want to know more about Onesimus, all they need to do is go to the book of where? Does anyone know? Study question I had on my test in school. What one letter is written to a master, a slave owner? <laughs> Philemon. Oh, that was, that was, <laughs> you got it. Oh, it was sure. right here. I was like, Philemon. Philemon. Yes. Philay. Philay mignon. So you remember it, right? That, this is where you go to learn about Onesimus. All right? That is addressed, it, it addressed him as a runaway slave, okay? Apparently, he fled. He fled the home of Philemon and Colossae. He went to Rome. There he comes across Paul. They get, they get together. Paul teaches him the gospel. He leads him to Christ. And because he was saved... He wants to return to his earthly master, which is quite the testimony, right? He wants to, so Paul writes him, and he, he wants to make whatever restitution he could as well. All right, so Paul then moves to those who are present with him. <coughs> All right, so there's Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, Concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. All right, so Aristarchus has this Greek name, like many Jews of the uh, Dysphoria. He was a native of Thessalonica, and he first appeared during Paul's three year stay at Ephesus, okay? He accompanied Paul on his return trip to Jerusalem and then to Rome. Now, we're not sure if he was with Paul throughout his entire prison time in Palestine, but now Paul tells Colossians he's with him. So he says he is Paul's fellow prisoner, so that would suggest he's been charged by the Jews with a crime, and he's awaiting a trial alongside Paul as well. So Paul says he also sends his greetings, all right? Here's the thing. It says, my fellow prisoner greets you, okay? It's not just a hello. He's not just, hey, he's saying hi. The greeting in Greek means to embrace, okay? And every time Paul uses it, it's a very strong expression of affection, okay? Today, we don't think of a greeting in that way. Like, oh, you know, tell so-and-so I said, hey. And, you know, this is... Tell the Colossians that I want to, I embrace them. I am, I have affection for them. I love them, okay? That's what that greeting means. And then Paul mentions uh, Mark. Anyone know who Mark is? John Mark, right? It's Mark. Anyone? <laughs> I just like saying my name, even though I go by Marcus. <laughs> All right, Mark was a companion of Paul and Barnabas. Um, he was with them on their first missionary trip, and he actually deserted them <laughs> when, uh, when everything seemed to, to get a little tough, okay? So this would later become the source of friction between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas wanted to take Mark along on the second journey. Paul didn't trust Mark to be loyal, so he says no, he refuses, and that leads, leads to the sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, and, and they separate from each other, and this is all in Acts, okay? So you, as you guys can tell, if you can't tell by now, 
all these people and all these things, you can find these stories and these other things. That's what's so cool about Scripture is most of these are like we can find out just exactly who these people are, what went on, what's the issue, okay? So by the time Paul's writing this, Mark had changed, okay? He had changed. He had been restored to usefulness, all right? He's not going to desert anyone any longer. And that would probably have been through the ministry of Peter in his life, okay? So that's 1 Peter 5, uh, 5 13. And also in Philemon uh, 24, uh, Paul, Paul names him among his fellow workers then uh, in, in, that, in that section. So Paul told the Colossians that if Mark came to them, all right, the, the little part that's in parentheses there in your Bibles, he, he says if, if Mark comes, obey Okay, obey him and obey his instructions and welcome him. Okay, so this here is saying that the church most likely knew of the past uh, desertion that took place, his unfaithfulness. All right. And so they needed this recommendation by Paul. All right. They were not to shun Mark because of what happened. In his previous failure, Mark later received then the privilege we know uh, that only three other men in history would ever have, and that was writing one of the Gospels, all right? He, he wrote the Gospel of Mark. And now next up is, says, Jesus, who is justice, all right? He had to make a <laughs> distinction there, all right? Justice. <clears throat> there are only three references to people named justice in the New Testament, and each one is different, all right? All we know about him is that he was both a Jew and a fellow worker of Paul uh, of Paul's in the proclamation of the gospel. Okay, so of all three, Paul says these are the only men of the circumcision among his fellow workers for the kingdom of God. Okay, so we should know what that is. The circumcision was given as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. All right, back in Exodus 12, 44, we see that it was carried over into the Mosaic Covenant. And as it developed through the history of Israel, um, it, it became this very strong symbol of who they were. And it, it was in the time of Jesus, too, in the first century. It became very clear that the circumcision was a title. All right. <laughs> It was a technical designation of the children of Israel. Okay, they're, they're known as this. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> they are very proud of this as well. So there's all these passages in Acts and in Paul's letters. And when instead of saying Israel... Or the Jews, they are simply called the circumcision, okay? That's who he's talking about. He's talking about Jews uh, or Israel. But things changed with Christ and his new covenant. Paul will make this clear so many times in his writings. But in Philippians 3, 2 and 3, it says that the church is the true circumcision. Those who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. All right. The church is the true circumcision. Therefore, it's the true Israel and true Jew. We are Jews. We are true Jews spiritually. Okay. We'll see this in Galatians as well. um, Because that is what they're trying to force on people. They're trying to say you have to be circumcised when that's against the gospel of Christ. You know, today it's not an issue. I mean, it's not that big deal. You know what I mean? Um, uh, But then it was like, you have to do this, right? So that's what's going on. So Paul goes on to saying that these, these three Jewish Christians had been a comfort to him. All right. By their activities in preaching the gospel, they were the soothing, uh, quieting influence to him. That's what in the Greek it, 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 comes across as. So Epaphras, in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, he greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. 
Now we know from the beginning of this letter, Epaphras, he was the founder of the church in Colossae, okay? He's most likely the pastor there. He holds this unique distinction among all the other friends and fellow workers of Paul um, of being the only one who Paul ex explicitly points out that he's praying, like has this like intensive prayer ministry, if you will. He says that he, he struggled on their behalfs in his prayers. All right, struggle in Greek, I think we've gone over this before, but it's agony. It's to agonize over something, okay? So Epaphras, he's this nearest, nearest example uh, of, of uh, Paul's exhortation that we have seen in this letter to devote yourselves to prayer. Right? Epaphras is a man much like Paul because the apostle uses the same words uh, to describe his own ministry for the Gentiles and the Colossians when he talks about striving and the conflict that he's having. All right, so this is like this is true discipleship that's going on. Um, also, the both of them, Epaphras and Paul, they, they are simply following the footsteps of, of their Lord when in agony. We know Jesus prayed, right? We, I mentioned that in the prayer. Jesus prayed. If Jesus prayed, we should pray. But we know that he was praying so fervently at one time that his sweat became like drops of blood that it, the scripture records. So Epaphras was specifically praying for their spiritual development, all right? That they would stand mature literally implies a firm standing in spiritual maturity, uh, they, let's not forget, they were struggling with uh, the false teachers and their teachings. And Epaphras is beseeching the throne of God that they might stand mature and not be moved, you know, not be tossed by every wind of doctrine that comes their way. He prayed that they would hold their ground spiritually and in doing so, in doing this, they would grow into stable, mature believers. And Paul continues and explained that Epaphras prayed that they might be fully assured in all the will of God. All right. Fully assured means controlled. They will be controlled in all the will of God. From, so from, from all Paul has laid out in this letter, we can tell they lacked the assurance of the sufficiency of Christ's work. So he prays that they will become richly satisfied by understanding the truth of the gospel, the truth in Jesus. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. All right, so Paul observed Epaphras firsthand. So he could bear witness. He's bearing witness about him that he had worked hard for them. <clears throat> Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. Um, as does Demas. Okay, so we know Luke, right? Gospel of Luke. He's educated. He was highly cultural, cultural Greek. He wrote Luke, and he also wrote Acts. Uh, Paul, Paul called him the beloved physician. So he was this Gentile believer. He traveled with Paul frequently, and he was possibly, possibly, people would say, uh, Paul's personal physician as well, which is interesting considering all the miracles that took place which means Paul still needed a doctor <laughs> so, at some point. I don't know uh, whether that's true or not. We can't be sure, although we do know that, you know, as a side note, all the stuff didn't take place all the time. Paul didn't, you know, we know Paul, his pieces of his garments and handkerchiefs he was sending out, people were getting healed by those. But Paul didn't send a handkerchief to Timothy along with the letter. Uh, and Timothy was sick. Paul told Timothy to drink a little bit of wine instead of just sending him a handkerchief so he could be healed. It's interesting. It's a side note, okay? <laughs> just pointing it out. So whether or not he was Paul's physician, I don't know if we'll ever know that, but he traveled with them, so he was obviously would have been helping some people um, or at least giving some advice maybe. So after joining Paul, on his second missionary trip, he was with him for the for the rem most of the remainder of Paul's life. All right. Now Demas also greets them. This is another faithful brother who served Paul, according to uh, again to Phile uh, Philemon, uh, but also remembered 
for deserting him as well as well because having gone to Thessalonica according to 2 Timothy 4:10. All right? So we don't really know what happened with him, but one view is that he became an apostate to Judaism and that after he deserted Paul. So verse 15 it says give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to it's either Nympha or Nymphe. Uh, there's uh, a debate on how on that for some reason. Uh, we'll say Nympha and the church in her house. All right, so Nympha's house needs to be considered as being part of the Laodicean church because of its close connection with that city, okay, in here in this, this text. We shouldn't think that the the inference here is that, sh- that she was the recognized uh uh, leader of the group or that she owned this house or just had a, her own private church. We don't have any idea about that. I'm not saying we should assume that because it's bad. I'm just saying we shouldn't assume. All right. Uh, we don't know. It should just be considered as part of the church in Laodicea. All right. Um, so it wouldn't have been the only place that there was a gathering together of believers. Okay. But it seems that uh, Nympha's place was one of many in that area where believers came together so that the the setup in the city was a scattered collection of groups of believers rather than just having this one specialized or localized place, a central place, which was owned by the lady in question here. We just don't know. Uh, Oftentimes they would gather uh, a synagogue, but you know, a lot of times in scripture, when people think house churches, when it says they were gathered uh, upstairs, these upstairs were huge. They still held two, three hundred people sometimes. So it wasn't like ten people getting together for a Bible study. You know, uh, it was could have possibly been a hundred or more people. And sometimes Paul would preach all night, and that one guy falls asleep and falls out the window, <laughs> uh, dies. I think Paul. I I'm assuming he died. Does it say he died? I think he says he died. Paul raises them back to life, brings them back up, and Paul keeps on teaching. So, <laughs> what? that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Anyway, I'm rambling, but I'm just saying, you know, not everything was just in these small settings and, and house church type of things. It was big gatherings. There was a lot of people. Uh, all right. So, <clears throat> the thing is about her, uh, this woman, is she is practicing hospitality. Okay, that's more than just opening your home. It means opening your heart to your heart to a strangers. Okay, that's what's going on there. Now, verse sixteen, it says, "When this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea." All right. So this city would have been the first city to have been visited by Tychicus as he journeyed towards Colossae. Really the only place, we know that the letters would have been read and they would have been circulated. It's really the only place, though, where Paul actually commands that the letter is read aloud by a group of believers who aren't the actual initial recipients of it, okay? Uh, The verse then supports this uh, important principle and truth to when reading and interpreting the Bible, which is this phrase, the Bible's not written to us. It's, but it's written for us, all right? This is literally what this means here, all right? The letter of Colossians was to be read by the Laodiceans, but it was not written to them, okay? But it was for them because they would benefit much from its teaching, as so can we. Now we get to verse 17, okay? Uh, and, to, and, and say to Arch, Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Now, again, from Philemon, this man is referred to as a fellow soldier. Paul is is saying, uh, he's telling him, do this uh, and do it now. Remember, this is being read out loud before uh, the entire church. And where Paul says, make sure... uh, he, he says, make sure you do this. See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. So it's a personal reminding to him, but it's also a confirmation to the fellowship 
that he was charged with a commission from God in a particular area uh, that the church should encourage. Okay, and then and finally, in verse eighteen, uh, this is going to be short, so that's okay. Well, we didn't have singing, so in verse eighteen, I Paul write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now, apart from Romans 16.22, uh, there's these, these four pla- places that are the clearest indication that Paul had his letters dictated, all right, rather than him sitting down and write, writing himself. But then when he did this, this last part, writing, I write this greeting with my own hand that served as uh, uh, authenticating Mark that the original recipients could trust to what was contained within the letter as being genuine and true. All right, he says, remember my chains. Paul wrote that. Uh, The only time Paul deliberately seems to ask for their their support in his imprisonment. Now he had asked for prayer. um, And then he says, remember my chains. It should be good for all of us uh, to remember his chains, right? Is what he's saying. You guys remember that. This is motivation to continue in your walk with God in difficult circumstances, right? We know Paul was hounded. He was persecuted. He was oppressed. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead on one occasion. Uh, He went through everything on account for the gospel. And he's saying, remember it. So remember that. (laughs) What is going on? I just hear all these weird noises coming from the corner. (laughs) and then he ends with this mention of grace okay so paul blesses them um, with continued favor and desires that they might continue to enjoy and be the recipients of the provision of the father all right so these these all were the people like paul willing to give up everything to follow jesus and they're working together, they're laboring in ministry together, and they're doing all these things, all right? It's an amazing thing to have friends like this, right? So it's not just fellow workers. These people were Paul's friends, all right? This would certainly to me is what biblical friendship looks like, all right? There are many of us that, that, that don't, that maybe don't have friends like this. Maybe maybe we don't even realize it, all right? Uh, That the thing these people had in common was this fervent love for Jesus. They were committed to Christ. Therefore, they were committed to one another on account of the gospel. That's what brought them together. They strengthened and comforted, comforted and agonized in prayer for God's will in their lives with one another. So in contrast, it embraces, it embraces one another with a Christ-like love, with comfort and, and joy. Oh, I, I skipped the part in the in contrast. When we see, excuse me, when we see that theology, okay, theology is just not this big word that we should be afraid of. It's the study of God's word, right? And when we see that theology is centered on God and on his word, then we see Jesus at the core of it, right? That's the core of it. And when we see Christ at the core, we see that he encompasses everything, right? We've seen wives, husbands, parents, workers, right? And and bosses and all that stuff. People doing ministry, people in prayer. We see all this. And then here we see biblical friendships we see friendships here that surpasses selfies right at wherever generic compliments likes and shares okay i'm not i'm not i'm just saying watch watch the documentary social dilemma (laughs) um but that, that, that's a lot of what friendship has come down to, even though we know it's more than that, right? It's not just social media today. Biblical friendship surpasses that. Biblical friendships goes beyond getting away from the family for a day just to complain about what's going on in your life as well, right? 
it, it's I, Paul and I became friends because he wanted to prove me wrong in my theology <laughs> in one of my one area of my theology right which ended up us becoming really close best friends and we talk every day <laughs> I do say Paul a lot. <laughs> Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament, so not this Paul, but um, but you know he was like he started questioning you know and all this. He was like, oh, I'm going to listen to everything that he he teaches on this one subject, and then he couldn't do it. And so then we started talking, and we were messaging for a while on Facebook, and then it was just like, about it, I have your phone number, and it sounds weird now, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that we have and I'll be honest we joke about it well, th th these are jokes but um, I didn't even I wasn't going to open this up but, you know, I didn't even plan on going here but we don't have a lot of other things in common <laughs> we don't you know this <laughs> right well I mean we always Put each other's taste in music down. We always, uh, yeah, we always will say, no, that movie's awful, and you say it's good, and vice versa. We always, and then it's like, why are we friends? <laughs> it's because we have this common denominator, the love of Christ and his word, and we can sharpen each other uh, because we can debate, and actually sometimes it seems like we're, we, we purposely, like, Get, try to get it under each other's skin on, on certain things and stuff, but it's all good at the end of the day because we're 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 joined by this this thing. It's a biblical friendship, really, and I'm thankful for it. Um, and and we, I, I know we have more things in common than what I'm saying, but I'm just using an example. So, all right. So all of that in contrast, right? It in it, it, it. All right. When you say. It's not selfies, it's not just not the generic compliments and the likes and the shares or whatever. All right, in contrast, biblical friendship embraces one another with this Christ-like love, with comfort and joy. It gently corrects and it shows the godly path too, right? It has wisdom to share and it has answers to give. In biblical friendship, prays, sometimes in agony for one another, holding one another up. When the good times are good, they're good. When the bad times are bad, they're bad because you share in those moments together. All right? So sharing in the good, sharing in the bad, worshiping God the entire time, that's what this looks like. And I, that's what I got from studying this section here. It declares a loyalty and commit, commitment because your first loyalty and commitment is to Christ, so you're committed to one another. So it, it's, it, it isn't just to have a friend for casual times and for convenience. It calls us to enter not just on the basis of mutual likes and dislikes, but out of a commitment to help one another realize their potential under God being placed in Christ. Right? So this biblical friendship then goes beyond what is humanly possible. At all, because it's made possible by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's why, you know, and Paul doesn't take all the credit either. He mentions these people. He gives them credit. He, he gives these, these expressions of beloved brother and a faithful minister and a servant. And he lifts them up and says, look at these people. They're part of this too. It's not just me. And that, that's what I got out of all of this, really. And I know it can seem not like a... a, a, a it's not the best sermon when you're going through these people and hey, blah, 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 blah. But when you see what's at the core of it, which is what I just shared, the biblical friendship part, then, I, then it makes it that much more meaningful. And that's part of the insight that can be lost if you just skip over those little parts. Because that's what I got out of it. So that concludes Colossians. Is there any questions, comments, or disagreements?